Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 18th of June 2020 today. These webinars are hosted by Sebastian Geiger from Heriot Watt University in Scotland and myself from TU Delft in the Netherlands. We are especially grateful to all our keynote speakers who have supported this initiative and to you all for joining us and combat work from home isolation. We wish all of you are in good shape and happy and healthy at the moment also. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and help us spread the words. All previous lectures are available on our YouTube channel. Now to the lecture of this week. We are pleased and honored to announce our keynote speaker of this week is Professor William Rossen from TU Delft. Bill is Professor of Reservoir Engineering and Head of the Section Reservoir Engineering at the Department of Geosciences and Engineering, which is one of the seven departments within the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences of TU Delft in the Netherlands. Bill has obtained his BSc in Chemical Engineering from MIT and his PhD also in Chemical Engineering from the University of Minnesota. After his PhD, he joined Chevron Oilfield Research Company, then located in La Habra in California. After spending about seven years with Chevron, he decided to join the University of Texas in Austin, first as assistant and associate and finally professor of petroleum and geosystems engineering. He also served as the chair of the department for about a year until 2006, when he moved to the Netherlands to become professor and head of the petroleum engineering section, the position he still holds today. The section name changed uh, starting this year, 2020, to be the section of reservoir engineering. Bill's research interests include development of innovative and efficient transport methods for fluid in the subsurface. For example, enhanced oil recovery methods, which are also combined with CO2 storage techniques. His groundbreaking mod modeling approaches address the complex physics of foam flow in porous media, the concept of surface forces and interactions of fluid and porous rock at various scales. He leads research in experimental, numerical, and field-based analysis. Bill has received a number of awards, including Pioneer of Improved Oil Recovery from SPE and Department of Energy of the U.S. Symposium on IOR in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2012, and the Distinguished Achievement Award for Petroleum Engineering uh, from the Petroleum Engineering Faculty uh, 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 from the Society of Petroleum Engineering, SPE, in 2002. His many awards and recognitions do not reflect only his excellent research, but also his outstanding teacher, as he was named the best instructor of the TU Delft University in 2011. It's a pleasure and honor to host him this week. Please note, uh, Bill's lecture will last for about 30 to 35 minutes, followed by questions and discussions at the end. Like before, please type in your questions in the chat room and Sebastian will chair the discussion session after Bill's talk. Bill, thanks once more and the stage is yours. Thank you, Hadi and Sebastian. Many thanks, it really is a great honor and privilege to be uh, able to give this talk. My topic today is foam generation trapping and flow and first some background. What is foam as it enters porous media? Well, the picture is schematically shown here. Uh, it's not tiny bubbles inside pores. Liquid films separate relatively large gas bubbles and reduce gas mobility. Foam is thus not a new phase, but a two-phase flow phenomenon that drastically reduces gas mobility. And as I mentioned, the bubbles are as big as the pores. Where is foam applied uh, in enhanced oil recovery, acid diversion? You can, well, you can read the applications there. And all of those cases 
phone behavior in the poor space is key, and that's a contrast with the cases listed at the bottom, many other applications of foam uh, in the energy industry where the flow geometry is much wider than the bubbles. But in this case, the bubbles are in tiny pores. So how does foam help in EOR? Well, uh, the main application is in gas injection. And gas can be really, really efficient where it sweeps, but the sweep efficiency is often poor for the three recent reasons listed here. Foam can help in all three of those areas. Foam actually behaves as though it was more viscous in higher permeability layers. Of course, foam has a very low mobility and helps viscous override. Its help for gravity override is indirect. Gravity override is the result of the competition between viscous pressure gradient in the horizontal direction and gravity. And if you increase the viscous pressure gradient, you uh, help to delay override. And foam has the extra advantage that it can have both high injectivity, high mobility near the well, and low mobility far from the well. There's another advantage that as foam forms as gas passes upward through sharp permeability boundaries, this reduces vertical permeability more than horizontal and uh, helps. And the two points noted with an asterisk here are unique properties of foam. How does foam help in the other applications? I won't, I won't read this aloud, you can, um, you can read it. Basically, in all cases, it diverts fluid flow to the places we want the fluids to flow. Well, I have been fascinated by foam now for almost for 30 or almost 35 years. And one aspect of that is we can't see what foam is inside of rock. We can see it inside of artificial, usually glass porous media, but then the question immediately rises how that reflects foam behavior in rock. So one thing I love working on foam is that you always have to keep in your mind that possibly everything we thought we knew was wrong. And the purpose of this talk is in large part to illustrate some of these surprises and what makes it such a fascinating topic. So I'm going to start with the question and to set up the question, we need to give a little bit of background. In porous media, foam, most foam bubbles are trapped in place by capillary forces. And the gas that does flow moves as illustrated here as bubble trains through beds of trapped gas. This picture is from a study of Falls et al. And it's a, a schematic of what they observed directly in a bead pack. So the question with which I want to start off the talk is as illustrated in red, what is the resistance to the movement of a train of bubbles like this one? Well, I started on this 30 years ago with a schematic model as illustrated here, just a train of biconical pores with individual soap foam films moving through it at a, at a rate imposed by pistons on either side. And what one realizes is this, is this is just a group of individual films moving through pores. And the first thing I realized is that this process is not symmetric in time because when the lamella reaches the middle of the pore, it's already occupying more than half the volume. So what we see actually is, as illustrated schematically here, the lamella reaches towards the middle of the pore. It's already spent more than half its time with a curvature that's pulling backwards because of surface tension. And then, it, then uh, I reasoned, it switches to a symmetric shape that pulls forward. Uh, so, but it's still, so part of the time it's pulling forward. And in a train of bubbles, some of the bubbles some of the lamellae are pulling the train forward, but most are resisting the flow. And that means effectively there's a yield stress. Uh, if you like, there's a yield stress on the bubble train it, uh, holding it back. Now in the laboratory, we had a piece of glassware for measuring gas flow rate and core flood. So I decided to take some photos that would show lamella shapes as they moved through this glassware and prove the picture that I had here. Well, after about 10 lamellae had gone through, I realized it wasn't happening the way I thought it was. And I then repeated the experiment under more controlled conditions illustrated here. This is a more or less biconical piece of glassware. It's about 10 centimeters long. And here's a soap film uh, moving outwards. And as you can see, as expected, the lamella is roughly perpendicular to the pore wall. 
So it moves outwards, it moves up towards the poor body. Um, and here I'm ready for it to make the jump. Whoa, I didn't expect that. And notice this is not a jump pulling forwards. This is a saddle shape with nearly zero curvature. It continues with a kind of an ambiguous or middling sort of curvature, then finally converges on a shape that pulls forward as it moves the rest of the way out of the pore. Well, why does it make, whoops, sorry. Why does it make this jump? It's because actually the lamella can reduce its surface tension if it takes a shape like this instead of the symmetrical shape uh, on the other pore. So it's actually reducing its surface energy by taking the asymmetric shape. Well, one more surprise is illustrated here. This is a, um, this was a, a work done by student Chong Shu a number of years ago. He developed a model for lamella moving through one pore, taking into account the drag of the lamella along the pore wall, which goes like the two thirds power of velocity. So let's, let's watch one of these lamella move through. Oh, I should mention these are two dimensional calculations. So it's a two dimensional pore. Okay, so we've seen it move through the pore here. It made the jump to the asymmetric shape as we uh, expected. I just wanna mention literally this, this computer program is at each step moving in the direction that the surface forces are pulling the lamella. So little perturbations drive it towards the shape of asymmetric shape in the middle of the pore. In the upper right, we illustrate the position of attachment of the two sides of the lamella. So at the beginning of the process and the end of the process, they are the same. In the middle, they're different. In the bottom right is the pressure difference across that curved film. And you'll notice it's a positive pressure difference or meaning, meaning it's resisting flow. It flips to that asymmetric shape and then it goes to a shape that pulls forward. And the fact that it goes to the asymmetric shape means it is spending less time pulling forward than it would otherwise do. Okay, so let's launch that for some more, some more of these passages. Where, oh, I should mention this is dimensionless velocity. So in effect, we're going at greater velocity as, as this parameter increases. We go up to a somewhat larger, um, velocity. Now I'm going to increase it just a bit more from 0 0.56 to 0 0.58. Whoa. Hey, that asymmetric jump disappeared. And that had, that meant there's, it's spending more of its time pulling forward. Now, as the velocity increases, there's a little, there is a drag component. So there's, there is some effect of the drag, but the capillary effect has been reduced. So what are the implications then for the pressure drop? The capillary contribution to this pressure difference needed to drive the flow decreases when there's this abrupt transition to symmetric behavior. Now, now here, what's illustrated is the average, time average, or it would be population average for a bubble train, pressure different, dimensionless pressure difference as a function of dimensionless velocity, and then epsilon is a measure of how rounded the pore is. So the top curve here is for the angular pore, and then it gets more and more rounded as we follow this graph, and then as these other graphs move in. Well, depending on the pore shape, the overall pressure difference decreases as the velocity rises. In fact, it could decrease discontinuously. Well, to see this in nature, we'd have to have a bubble train moving through absolutely identical pores. So what we'd see in nature would, would be as expected here. Well, a transition happening in all different velocities. So it'd be a very much more shear thinning kind of behavior, but probably not quite the abrupt transition we're seeing. So this, one of the surprises in foam is that this, this contribution of the capillary forces shifts with velocity in a way that I wouldn't have expected at the start. But now to the main focus of the talk, which is foam generation trapping. And I'm gonna substitute the word propagation for flow. The ability of foam to be injected at the well and flow radially outwards indefinitely. 
And I'm going to take this out of order and first actually deal with trapping. Now, as I noted, most, most of the gas in foam bubble is the most of the bubbles are trapped. And if you have a make a whole series of assumptions, if there's uh, no fluctuations in the flow paths, absolutely identical velocity along all of those bubble trains, and no mass transfer with the trapped gas, no dispersion, then it's unambiguous. The gas tracer breakthrough directly tells you how much gas is flowing. But there is mass transfer between the flowing and the trapped gas. The tracer in the flowing bubbles diffuses through the liquid films into the trapped gas. So you have to infer you have to fit a model for both convection and mass transfer with the trapped gas and from that infer what the flowing fraction is based on your what comes out of the core in the effluent. Now this is an indirect sort of process. Um, professor Pacelli Zita and at the time PhD student Wok Nguyen, who's now a professor at University of Texas, but Professor Zita is here in Delft. I, I was not here in Delft. I can brag about this work uh, with a clear conscience because I had nothing to do with uh, carrying out the experiments. They did some really innovative work on injecting a tracer into a core that is visible in CT scanning. It turns out I hadn't thought about this. I always thought gas tracers are invisible. Gases are invisible. Xenon has a big enough nucleus that it, it can be seen in a CT scan. So they use CT imaging to observe the concentration in xenon gas tracer. They established steady state foam with nitrogen, then substituted some xenon from the nitrogen and took some CT images. The other experimental um, aspects are shown here. And they then we can reconstruct cross-sectional images from the axial uh, from the axial images. So here's one of the cross-sectional themes. I got I got involved in this work after long after the experiments were over. And what I'm, you can see, gas is sort of coming through, poking through in a number of locations. I'm just going to focus on one location here, and uh, see where where we go. So. Okay, so what we're seeing is, well, we could have put the circle, we could have put the oval in other places. The gas comes through in, in a sort of a narrow path and then, well, I, argued, I would argue diffuses outwards. And these are kind of independent little pathways. So we came up with a, um, we came up with a model for this process. And, uh, okay, so here's a brief description. First of all, the CT images show that the tracer did not flow at all in about a third of the core, or at least near the inlet, it didn't. Where it did flow, it advanced in what we characterized as unit cells with a core of flowing gas in the middle and then diffusion outwards into trapped gas to the edge of the unit cell. And then at the boundary of the unit cell would be other, you know, would be other pathways, the diffusion outwards from other pathways. Well, if we represent this as a unit cell, then we approximate the oval as a cylinder, then a two-dimensional model for convection and diffusion can represent this process. That model has two parameters. One is the flowing fraction and the other is the diffusion coefficient. We can estimate the diffusion coefficient from the slow invasion of tracer from the end plate where it's not flowing and from that, estimate of the diffusion coefficient, we can estimate the flowing fraction of the tracer within the unit cells. The result is kind of striking. We find that a 10% of the radius of the unit cell, which means 1% of the volume in the unit cell is flowing. And that's only in about two thirds of the cross section of the core. When we took that same data and applied the effluent analysis to the data, what we found was an estimate of roughly 50%. Now, I would not swear about that this 1% is the number. I'm pretty sure it can't be lower because that's already saying it's flowing in a region about one pore Y, but it could be 5%, 3%, I don't know. But the point is it's a lot lower than we would have estimated from the effluent and it's a quite 
small number. So that's some surprises we found about trapping and how to measure it. Now let's look at foam generation, and in particular, foam generation in steady gas liquid flow. If we establish a gas saturation in the core, so we inject gas and liquid without surfactant, and then we introduce surfactant into the core, a number of studies find a minimum pressure gradient or minimum velocity for foam generation. This is illustrated schematically here. Uh, if we inject at a particular velocity and measure pressure gradient, we can increase velocity and not see anything very interesting happen. And each time, you know, waiting to establish steady state, but there comes some point where the next increase in velocity, bam, within, within moments, the pressure starts rising precipitously in the core and eventually settles down to a value tens, hundreds or more times the original pressure gradient. Then once that's established at steady state, you can reduce the velocity to the same velocities where you had low pressure gradient before. Now, we were looking for an explanation for this, and we settled on um, one particular mechanism of creating lamella, of creating new films. It's called lamella division. It's illustrated schematically in the picture on the lower right. If I have a, a lamella uh, or a, a soap film, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned, I'm using this technical term lamella or lamella in the plural to mean soap film. If I have a soap film sitting in a pore throat, if I can push that out of the pore throat, every time it goes through a pore body with unoccupied pore throats, multiple unoccupied pore throats, the lamella either breaks when it's touched at a sensitive spot or it divides. So what was one lamella here becomes two, two can become four as it goes to the next pore body, eight, 16, 32. This is a way to rapidly create a foam but it does require moving lamellae and that requires a pressure difference, a pressure difference to stretch that film and push it into the pore body. So the question then is how does the minimum pressure gradient we observe macroscopically relate to the microscopic value that we need to displace individual lamellae? So working with uh, Phil Gauglitz, a, a pal at the time at Chevron, we worked we derived a percolation theory to relate the microscopic behavior to the macroscopic behavior and came up with a model for this, um, for this process. And what this does is it predicts indeed a minimum pressure gradient for flow and it makes some other striking predictions that agree with theory. First of all, it, in the model, the minimum pressure gradient scales like one over the permeability and fill Phil, it took a lot of trouble to take these data over two and a half orders of magnitude and permeability. And if you look at the legend, you can see all of these are unconsolidated grain packings. So they're geometrically similar porous media. And for those geometrically similar media, the scaling goes like one over permeability. Not quite so simple for more complicated uh, com uh, consolidated porous media. Also, the theory predicts that the, it should be easier to create a supercritical CO2 foam because the surface tension with surfactant is lower. Now, to be honest, it doesn't predict that small, a, uh, a, that big a drop, but it does predict a lower value. And Phil went to a lot of trouble to collect these data. There, there was really painstaking work to be able to measure the conditions at which foam is created because it, it is created so easily. As you can see, you need a very small pressure gradient. One other interesting point, it fits foam generation as a function of velocity and liquid volume fraction if we allow for one adjustable parameter. So without the parameter, it's the dotted line and with the parameter, it's, uh, it's a solid line. Well, how would we put this sort of behavior into a numerical simulator? That's with a, an established technique and, and uh, I'm going to now move on to propagation then because we're, we want to um, want to simulate the ability of foam to move outwards in radial flow. So the way we put it into a simulator is with something called a population balance. Uh, and there we define another compositional variable, if you will, the, the number of lamellae per unit volume, which is then treated like 
water, like gas, it's treated as a component. It has its own balance equation, the population balance for the creation, destruction, and transport of these lamellae. There have been a number of, of these models, uh, professors Radke and Kovsek of uh, now, now um, Berkeley and Stanford, Andy Falls of Shell, Friedman and Gauplitz of Chevron. There are a number of population balance models. But well, working with uh, postdoc Sung Cam, now a professor at LSU, Louisiana State University, we developed a population balance model with a lamella creation term that depends on pressure gradient. And it produces the fits that are illustrated here. It can, uh, it can represent a threshold velocity or pressure gradient for foam generation, jump to another state, a persistence of that state as then velocity is reduced. It also predicts something, if it predicts there should be some point at which we fall off the cliff and the foam uh, uh, corrupt, uh, collapses again. Now, I want to be clear about this. There are lots of assumptions, and this is not by any means a complete model for all aspects of foam. We wanted a model that represents this one particular aspect. Okay, so then, now the population balance is usually used in a numerical simulator, but if we assume local equilibrium between the creation and destruction uh, uh, processes, then we can apply the method of characteristics of this process, um, our fractional flow theory. Now, we all had fractional flow theory in school, usually referred to as buckley Leverett theory for a water flood. Uh, the lower right curve illustrates what the fractional flow curve looks like for gas water flow. This is gas water and the foam enormously reduces gas mobility, shifting the curve to the left and upwards. Um, something we didn't cover in school, and we don't tend to cover in school, is that the solution depends on behavior at the small scale and the traveling wave at the shocks. You actually can't be sure of your solution on this diagram until you solve the differential equation for what happens on the small scale at shock fronts. It's a, it's a useful, it's not a complete model. You make lots of assumptions, incompressible fluids and, and so forth. We do allow for non-equilibrium at the traveling wave when we solve for the shock. Now, in uh, PH, uh, in 2012, PhD student Elham Ashuri, working with Professor Dan Marchesin of IMPA in Brazil, applied, the, um, applied this method. They solved for the traveling wave at shocks, and this put a limit on the possible solutions to the fractional flow behavior. So now, as you can imagine, let me go back a slide. If we've got multiple steady, multiple possible steady states, the fractional flow curve is going to be complicated. And indeed, it is. The um, local equilibrium fractional flow curve is shown in blue in these different cases. Each one of these curves is for a different velocity, and it's um, decreasing velocity as we go right, then down, and then right again. And uh, they solved the traveling wave equation at the shocks, and what they and the solution is if we're injecting a foam of, uh, I think a little bit less than 10% gas here, J, and it's in light green, I hope you can see it. The initial condition is I, and the solution is shown in green. Now, Actually, at a greater velocity than this, you jump immediately from J to I. But as velocity decreases, we get an intermediate state. And then as velocity continues to decrease, the allowed solution has decreasing velocity towards the intermediate state. So this is strong foam on the left. This is weak foam, might not even be recognized as a foam at all here. So we have been, what, what this would look like is foam, a gas bank out ahead of it, a relatively slow moving foam, surprisingly slow moving foam, a gas bank out in front displacing the initial condition. And eventually there comes a point where the foam stops moving at all. The foam itself is stable, but the allowed solution has zero velocity displacing the gas bank out in front. 
Now in radial flow, this would represent the velocity at some particular radial position um, in, uh, in the radial position in uh, radial distance from the well. Now the reference is shown down here. Um, now I will say this model again has more assumptions and simplifications than as the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy says than the mind can comfortably comprehend. But there have been studies showing a failure of foam propagation at low velocity going back at least to the 1990s. Uh, Francois Friedman at Chevron has a, a number of papers showing a lower limiting velocity for foam propagation. We set out to test this case. And, and I will say it's not clear from the earlier studies, let me back up, is, is the failure to propagate happening because we fall off the cliff? Or as, as Elham Ashuri's work shows, and with Professor Marcheson, because no, we're, the foam is still stable. We haven't fallen off the cliff, but the velocity has gone to zero. So we used a technique, frankly, borrowed from Fossoff or even we had a core of multiple diameters. And the procedure is roughly as follows. We inject surfactant solution and gas at uh, low injection rates where nothing happens in the first section. And then when the pressure, now notice the pressure taps here are located away from the, the section boundaries. When the pressure delta P1 starts to rise abruptly, we know, okay, foam's being created in the first section and we quick reduce the injection rate because we don't want it going to the next section yet. So let, once the foam is established, let it stabilize in the first section without propagating into the second one. Then we start increasing injection rates until the pressure drop, well, first of all, in the first section starts rising again, indicating it's starting to get into the second section. And then the second pressure drop, a little bit later, the second pressure drop starts to rise. Let that stabilize, indicating that in the middle section, we've got foam. Okay, let that stabilize, started increasing the injection rates again. And we, until pressure starts to rise again in the second delta P, then the third, fourth, fifth, and eventually the sixth, then we get propagation all the way through the core. Then we start cutting back on injection rates until the pressure drops in the downstream sections falls off precipitously. This is what I referred to as falling off the cliff before. And then keep reducing the rates till the pressure drop in the second delta P falls off precipitously. And in this fairly complicated sequence, we get one measurement of the minimum velocity for generation, one, two measurements of the velocity for propagation based on the two sections, and two measurements of the minimum velocity to maintain the foam based again on the middle and the downstream section. One other point I want to make clear, foam is, we're pretty sure it has not collapsed completely. Not, not all the soap films have burst, but pathways have opened up to allow gas to flow without interruption by film. So what, what's referred to by the foam community as a continuous gas foam, some beds of trapped gas, but pathways for continuous gas flow to flow through it. And the pressure drop is much, much lower in that case. Okay, so we get, um, we get these measurements and here's the result. We find three limiting superficial velocities, a, which we'll call UT gen, the critical total superficial velocity for generation illustrated in by green symbols here, the minimum velocity for propagation. Okay, so what we did again, we generate the foam. Actually, once we get up to this curve, we cut it way back to see to, to fall into this range here. And then we increase velocities till we get propagation. So that's what we'll call UT prop, the critical velocity for propagation. Then we reduce the velocities till we fall off the cliff to look for UT collapse. And uh, this work was done by Wan Kun or uh, Brandon Yu. Here's a current PhD student here. It's been accepted for SBE journal. It's in a preliminary form in an EAGE uh, IOR meeting preprint. Um, this is for one particular surfactant concentration, three different gas fractions, 
And uh, well, first of all, like in agreement with the theory, these velocities uh, at uh, shift to lower velocities under wetter conditions. And there's definitely beyond the range of the uncertainty in our measurements, there is a distinction between the velocity for propagation and the velocity at which we, um, we fall off the cliff. So we find lower limiting velocities for propagation and foam stability. And the propagation velocity is larger than the stability limit. Now, I need to make two really important points here, lest one draw conclusions, negative conclusions, pessimistic conclusions that don't necessarily apply. These studies were conducted under idealized conditions, low temperature, low salinity, nice, clean, high perm, uh, Bentheimer sandstone, uh, anyway, in all ways favorable to foam. So the, the pressure gradients are big. The, um, and the velocities are low. In this study, the, you will know, notice these velocities, well, who cares if this happens at less than a foot per day, we're, we're gonna keep velocities bigger than that in the field. But we need to extend this to, to higher temperatures, higher salinity, um, maybe adverse wettability conditions, lower perm rock, and see what happens to these velocities. That, that's going to be more of a challenge. It's possible, though, that the pressure gradients will come down, and that might be good news. Um, so it needs to be extended to more realistic conditions. And I have one more caveat that I think is summarized uh, on the next slide. So the summary for trapping and uh, flow, capillary forces trap most of the gas bubbles as foam flows through geological porous media. Uh, the CT study I referred to, you know, carried out by Professor Zita and uh, now Professor Nguyen, um, I was kind of a latecomer to that work, suggests that trapping is much greater if you look at the CT images than you would have guessed from an, analyzing the effluence. Capillary forces make the rheology of flowing bubbles very complex and probably more shear thinning than we're representing it in our models. That's even before we get into the effect of pressure gradient on gas trapping. Uh, and a model for capillary resistance to flow and to jumps during lamella movement suggests that the rheology of these bubbles is very shear thinning. The summary of the generation and propagation. Um, many studies find the minimum velocity or pressure gradient for the creation of low mobility foam, what we normally think of as foam in steady two-phase flow. Then what we find is two states at the same injection velocities, depending on what you were doing before, whether you created a strong foam there or not. We have a population, actually a number of varieties of that population balance model now that can represent this behavior. The models also suggest a minimum velocity to maintain foam. There's a point where you fall off the strong foam state at a minimum velocity. An analysis of an advancing foam front with this model suggests that there could be issues with foam propagation far from an ejection well. And essentially what happens is at the lamella front, uh, the pressure gradient is not enough in the transition between the strong foam and no foam. It's not strong enough to keep the bubble generation to up, up to speed with the destruction. And it's distinct from the minimum velocity to maintain the strong foam. Now, the two caveats are we need to extend this to more realistic conditions. The second caveat that I didn't mention before is that there are, we don't need necessarily to inject and push the foam out far from the well. There are other ways to create foam far from an injection well. In particular, uh, you can create foam at sharp changes in permeability, and that does not re depend on velocity. So with that, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions. And my email address is here if there's anything we don't get to in the discussion section. Thank you very much, Bill, for the very uh, interesting talk. Uh, I would like to, uh, again, ask the audience, please type uh, your questions in the chat room. Uh, stage is uh, all your Sebastian. OK, I, I, I believe I stopped sharing the screen now, shall I? or? Yeah, the screen is, is taking off now. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk, Bill. Um, we do have some questions coming through. So the first one is from 
Musa Hussaini Mir, who asks, um, I'm wondering how lamella division effects influence the form generation, the lamella reaches the tip. Sorry. I'm wondering how the lamella division effect influences the form generation if it reaches the tip of a highly conductive fracture with a very small aperture. Okay. The, um, uh, if, if we're flowing into the tip, uh, okay, depends. If it's a highly, con highly conductive fracture, chances are the fracture is so wide that capillary forces are maybe not so important. And we've got, a, um, we've got something more like bulk foam. The bubbles are big, or excuse me, the bubbles are small compared to the, uh, to the fracture. But you, you point out a very good point. If the fracture gets narrow and then gets wider, as if you force the flow through the narrow spot, actually there's a different mechanism called snap-off that happens as you go from, a, from the narrow spot into the wide spot. Some, some works by uh, Professor Kovsek at Stanford, uh, well, I'm not gonna be able to mention all the co-authors, I think it was with Professor Furno uh, in Norway, found that in, when you've got fractures, when you go through a narrow spot, then when you come back out wide again into a vulgar or into a wider fracture, that's a lovely place to generate foam coming out of the narrow, coming out of the narrow place. Um, so there would be foam generation, not actually going into the tip, but coming out of the narrow spot into the wider fracture. Thank you. The next question is from Kiang Zhu. This is great to listen to your lecture again, Rosten. Can you please talk about how foam texture is affected by some parts and velocities? Okay, well, um, uh, okay, f well, uh, yeah, in uh, in lamella uh, lamella division, first of all, it's it's the process is kicked off by um, uh, by velocities. Uh, sand packs are, they are simple porous media. So I'm, I'm sorry, Chong, Chong Shu, you may need to send in the question again to clarify. A sand pack is an example of a porous medium. Uh, and actually sand packs are often used as, a, as an upstream generator to create a foam going into your apparatus. If you want to have a foam, uh, you know, you don't, want to cre you don't want to bother with creating the foam inside your core. You want to have a foam going in, then you might use a sand pack. The sand packs are examples of, of uh, porous media. The, uh, the velocities, the main thing that I've looked at is the kicking off up to the upper state on that graph. Now, once we're in the upper state, then it's, I think, destruction, the generation is, is going crazy. It's destruction now that's stepped in and it's the limiting pro process. On the lower branch, generation, is limiting because it's not sufficient. Once we kick off the generation and we've got a large pressure gradient, plenty of generation going on, then it's destruction. And the um, well, the destruction is mostly a result of either capillary pressure, the so-called limiting, there's a limiting capillary pressure. When foam gets to a particular capillary pressure, it collapses abruptly. Um, or I would argue of diffusion. If, if the bubbles get to be bigger than, excuse me, if you've got generation going so crazy that you've now got tiny bubbles inside of a pore, those bubbles equilibrate by diffusion amazingly rapidly. I mean, it's a, in fact, Chong Chu, you probably in grad school had to do the homework problem that I gave where a, a bubble of 100 microns in diameter disappears by diffusion into its larger neighbors in a matter, I think, of tens of seconds. So there's quite rapid diffusion on the pore scale to give you bubbles as big as pores. Um, and so once we've got the good strong foam, velocity is not so important, I think, to the foam. It's not the primary determinant of foam texture. Thank you. We have two questions that are related. So I'm going to read them one by one. The first one is from Leila Hakimi. Again, thank you for great presentation. If you would like to know whether the practice parameters influence the minimum pressure gradient to mobilize the mirror in the pool network. And related to that question is one from Eric Warner, 
Again, thank you for the presentation. And he asked if you could please explain the distinction or relationship between the minimum pressure gradient and the minimum loss of form generation. Okay, let, let me answer the second one first, because that's uh, really we think it's we think it's pressure gradient that's the primary variable because it's um, uh, uh, you know, it's the pressure difference to push that lamella out of its narrow throat and make it, you know, make it stretch to go into the pore body. So the, if you like, the primary physical cause is pressure gradient. But what we can control in the lab easily is velocity. So it, um, it, it, you know, we tend to we tend to do our experiments where we set the velocities and then we measure the pressure gradients. Um, uh, Phil Gauglitz, in one of the graphs in the presentation, did experiments at constant fixed pressure and constant uh, gas fraction, and that is a pain. You're, you've got to constantly have a feedback loop to keep the two flow rates going the same. With with uh, Guangkang Yu and I, we tried to repeat those experiments, and, it, and it, our control scheme just was really difficult. It, it kept sort of going nuts, and our gas fractions were changing and so forth. So. Again, I would say the pressure gradient we think is the primary cause, but velocity is how we can, you know, how we can affect it and control it in the lab. You know, Gar says you increase velocity, then the then the pressure gradient goes up until and then these things kick off. To the first thing, what are what are the other variables? Well, surface tension, because again, it's the surface tension says how much surface energy do I need to make that that lamella come out of the throat. So that's that is why it's it's uh, so much easier to make a CO2 supercritical CO2 foam than to make a nitrogen foam at room temperature. The the surface tension for supercritical CO2 is um, oh I don't know depending on conditions anywhere from ten to thirty times lower than it is for nitrogen. Um, the uh, um, in fact, we were getting ready. We were getting ready. Phil and I were getting ready to do our, our talk, and Phil happened to be at a conference and with uh, with coffee or or maybe beers with some guys and who were doing CO two experiments. And he heard this and he rushed back and said, "Phil, we got to revise the paper. We, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, we, we we this is important." And um, and in fact, when I was at Chevron, down the hallway were folks working on CO two foam. And they didn't know why we were so obsessed with this minimum condition for foam generation because they always saw foam generation. Um, and partly because they were doing drainage experiments, there are different mechanisms when gas first invades the porous medium, then there are different mechanisms that come into play there. But also because the surface tension I think was so low that they just never saw a plate case where they didn't have foam. In fact, Phil had to go to a lot of trouble to obtain those data on that slide for CO2 foam. To, to be able to control things to get a low enough pressure gradient to get any examples that weren't that weren't foam before he then got got foam. So surface tension, pore geometry would have an effect. Well, that's the reason for that the, the one over k factor is because the radius of the pore throat uh, is crucial to, to how much delta p you need to make that that thing uh, that lamella move out. And so poor length and poor radius uh, are both involved. And th when you put them together, you end up with uh, something like permeability for geometrically similar porous media. So those, I would say, are the two, two main factors. Thank you. Um, we're getting a number of questions coming through. So I'm trying to group them. And I'm staying on the foam generation for a bit more longer before we talk move to upscaling of foam and other applications. So let me just find the right question. So one question we had from Bruno ask um, the foam behave differently according to the porous media readability for carbonate reservoirs with the mixed wet low wet. Very, very differently. That, well, a classic study um, in 1990, early 1990s, uh, Sanchez and Hazlett, they were working with deliberately altered bead packs of different wettability, and they concluded that uh, if surfactant can create a foam in an oil wet bead pack, it has to first change the wettability. And if you think about it, the logic is my soap film is a high, a high energy state stretched between two solid surfaces. 
if the solids don't strongly want to have water on their surface, then they'll just let go and the, and the lamella will collapse. So there's a good reason why wettability would be important, why you need strong water wetting to, uh, to make foam stable. Now, more recent work has shown that maybe, it, maybe it's more ambiguous. It may be that you don't have to reverse the wettability, but still it is a lot more difficult to create foam in oil wet media, especially if there's oil present. Because if, well, if there's oil present, then you've got actually a film of oil. It may be only a molecular level, but you've got a film of oil on top of, on top of the rock. So we take one more question to foam generation, and then we move to some really other, um, just another really interesting question. Mikol Lima asks you, thank you. Could you please explain if there's a relationship between surfactant concentration and foam generation? Yes, there, there, uh, um, there is. In fact, if if you um, look, uh, I can't quote the article directly, but the same student, Brandon Yu or Guangkun Yu, did a study looking at uh, minimum velocity for foam generation as a function of concentration in a separate study and found uh, a link. And it's well, what I would say is the the step of creating the lamella should not depend so much on surfactant concentration. At least if we're above the critical micelle concentration, uh, then, you know, then, then the, the properties of the film aren't that different. But the stability of the film does depend on surfactant concentration. So, you know, I'm, I, in some sense, I'd be creating lamellae at the same rate, but a larger fraction of them would be bursting right away if I was at a lower surfactant concentration. And therefore, what we observe is foam generation, which is the net, uh, the net victory of, gen of, de of creation over destruction. That net effect does depend on surfactant concentration. So, if you if you write to me, I'll, I'll be happy to send you the the reference. Or if you again, if you look for uh, G. Dot U and Rawson, uh, you can find the reference to that. Thank you. So take. Put one question forward or by Manuela Bastidas, but there are quite a few who have asked questions around that, um, um, around, along the same lines. And she asks, what can we create foam to store chemicals, hydrogen safely underground and others? And um, Leila and many others have asked, you know, what are the benefits of using foam for CO2 storage? Can we store CO2 more safely underground? So, can we use CO2 uh, foam to store hydrogen and CO2 safely in the ground in the subsurface? Um, okay, well, let me start with the CO2 because the uh, that's uh, easier. In in CO2, what tends to happen is the CO2 comes in and whoop, immediately to the top and forms uh, a gas cap under the under the overbird, and the thicker the gas cap the larger the pressure on the overburden and the um, more, uh, well, the greater stress on the overburden, the greater the possibility of cracking the overburden and letting, letting the gas out. Okay, so if, if we could make, if we could make the CO2 flow farther outwards before it finds its way up, that would, that would reduce the size of the, uh, of the gas cap and possibly reduce the pressure on the overburden to make the whole process safer. Also, we've trapped more gas in place by capillary forces and it's sitting down there as the aquifer flows by, so it's probably going to dissolve faster because, uh, you know, aquifer is directly perhaps flowing through it. And also, the as I mentioned, the trapped gas fraction in foam is quite good, so we, rather than or oh, just making it up 20% gas, residual gas, you might have, uh, uh, I don't know, 80%. So to the extent that we can build out this a bigger horizontal zone before the override, that, that's good for CO2 sequestration. It would need to be double checked whether it's worth it to pay for, you know, to pay for the cost of the surfactant and so forth, but, but it would have that benefit. For hydrogen, um, 
I think you, you'd have to be careful of one process because you, you want to push it out and then you want to produce it again. And um, you, it might be a nightmare to be trying to produce hydrogen back with a foam, uh, with foam around, uh, around your well. It, it might be doing too good a job of blocking. blocking. And, and, and uh, I mean, it would have the same effect. It would make the hydrogen tend to go more horizontally. And maybe that's a good thing, reducing, you know, reducing stress at the overburden and so forth. Uh, but it could be a, you know, it could be a problem for reducing, producing the hydrogen back. Thank you very much. So let's move a little bit up the scale. And there are quite a few questions around scale. Um, and I try to group them again together. So you have a question from Banda al Karimi, who thanks you for the interesting talk. And he would like to know how we can scale up these experiences, these experiments to the field scale. Again, Manuela asked a very similar question. What is the right scale to model foam? Okay, at, uh, it, it depends on which aspect we want uh, we want to model. Actually, I would say that uh, the uh, um, the simple, the relatively simple foam models uh, um, that are are in use that are you know they're just sort of put in uh, okay empirical equations for foam behavior. You know. Uh, those work about, for many applications, those work about as well as our much more complicated ones. The population balance models work. Well, they, each one has particular applications, the particular things it can represent. So if, if your concern is about foam generation processes in steady flow, I would argue that the population balance model that, that I and Professor Cam uh, developed and that he, he continues to um, develop separately, that it has that advantage. Um, but, uh, and if you're interested specifically in this propagation issue, then that's, uh, then, then that would be, you know, that's an, I think an advantage that the um, population balance model, that population balance model can address. Um, uh, for, for the, um, you know, for other purposes, I think these I, well, I think, I believe I created the phrase semi-empirical in a paper because I was looking down my nose at, at some models and, and um, uh, wanted sort of to suggest that mine was better. And then um, now that has become the universal way to refer, uh, virtually universal way to refer to these models that are not population balance models. I think those um, models are... Um, they're, they do about as good a job of representing behavior on the large scale. Again, depending on what we want to uh, represent, we do have a definite problem that in heterogeneous, you know, in a big grid block with layers of different properties, there are all sorts of things going on that will be difficult to represent. And we'll probably have to come up with some ad hoc, you know, rough approximate way to represent what's going on in those to be able to put into a big simulator because we can't represent every, you know, if you've got layers of tens of centimeters and, you know, thing and lenses that disappear on a distance of meters, we can't put that into a, into a big reservoir simulator. We're going to need some approximate way to, to represent that. Thank you. So you talked about heterogeneity and we do have a questions on that very topic. I'm from Juliana Fasania. So hi, Juliana, good to see you online here. Um, again, thanking you for the excellent presentation. And she asks, many studies investigate heterogeneity in the form of layers of different permeability. Do you think the current approach is the same for, say, buggy carbonates? Okay. Um, let me jump to the final thing. No, very different. But let, let me, if I may, deal with heterogeneity in three parts. The first is just... Uh, uh, permeable layers of different permeability, foam has different properties. As I mentioned, it tends to be stronger in layers of higher, more resistant. It behaves as though it's more viscous in layers of higher permeability. But also when flow crosses from abruptly from one permeability to another, in particular when it goes from low permeability to high permeability, there can, there's a generation process that goes on. 
So it's, uh, it, that's another effect of permeability in consolidated layers. In buggy layers, I, I, um, well, if you have continuous bugs, I think we've got a real problem there because then now we're back to what in the second or third slide I call um, bulk foam. It, it is like beer at the top, uh, foam at the top of a beer glass or, or at the top of a champagne bottle or something. It's in a big container, the gas bubbles move up, the liquid drains down relatively freely there. there I think um, it's gonna be difficult it's going to be difficult if if the channels are big enough that capillary forces are not dominant and they're connected. You know, again, as I as mentioned before, if they pinch out every so often, well, then we got hope. We can generate the foam every time they come out of one of those pinches. But if they're interconnected, I think we we've got a problem. And in fact, in uh, the 1990s, the um, there was work done by my uh, former colleague Francois Friedman uh, and uh, some folks at a service company, oh, and I'm probably going to guess it wrong, but they, what they just, they sort of threw up their hands. It was, I think, with the Rangeley field, they said, it's it's going to separate unless we put polymer into the foam. So they more or less created, with chemicals in the foam, things to prevent the drainage, uh, you know, prevent it from separating, even if capillary forces were not were not important. So very, very much different in if the bugs connect. Now, if the bugs don't connect, as I mentioned, you've got uh, you've got an advantage there. And my uh, former student, Chris Buya, in his PhD dissertation, looked at an Indiana limestone, which had bugs, and they were like millimeters in size and disconnected. And a really nice work he did with the CT, he showed that inside that little bug, the foam was segregating. You could see the gas moving to the top and the liquid kind of going down to the bottom. But on that scale, when it went out back into the rock, it, it was back as a foam. It, that didn't cause a problem with the sweep as a whole. Great, thank you. There are plenty, plenty of questions left and we always have more questions than we can handle during the Q&A session. So my sincere apologies to all the questions I couldn't take, but I hopefully have We've answered at least some of them, at least some of the topics. But yet, sorry yeah, that I had to yeah. mute you. Yeah, and I just quickly say, please, I'm eager to, to discuss this. And so send, send me emails to that address that I, that's on the slides. And if uh, I will say, we are rolling into exam time here. So if you don't get an answer for a week or two, please don't give up, you know, contact me again or, or, or it's probably safest to contact me again because if it gets, you know, buried down off the page on the email. Uh, but I, I will, I do want to discuss this. Please get in touch with me. That's a fantastic offer. Thank you. I'm going to close before I hand over to Hardy. I'm going to close with one comment from Seung Kam. Um, not a question, but a comment. This talk reminds me of um, your summer form you are course at UT Austin 25 years ago. Time flies, excellent presentation with fantastic updates on the recent work. So on behalf of Stone and everyone in the audience, thank you very, very much for a great talk. And thank you everyone for the excellent questions. Hadi, over to you. Thanks, thanks very much uh, uh, everyone. I would like to uh, announce our next week uh, keynote speaker is Professor Anne uh, Margaret from Imperial College and would uh, speak about the phenomena of viscous fingering in porous media. So stay tuned, stay happy, healthy, and safe until next week. Bill, thanks once more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Really a pleasure and, a, and an honor to be in such a distinct speaker as well. Thank you very much, Bill. Bye bye.